um, say, oh, how do I explain uh, my, my child is transgender, or how, I how do I explain this transgender person to my child as though it will hurt them somehow. But really, <laughs> <laughs> when, you know, kids will absorb whatever you tell them to, you know, if they see transgender people portrayed positively in comics and the media and don't say, oh yeah, this is just another way to be a person, then that's the way that they're going to take it. <laughs> so, it's good to have more of that in the, the conversation. And because it's comic books, uh, there are a very small number of characters who are transgender and who happen to have a superpower that's somehow related to shape-shifting or to uh, embodying male and female characteristics simultaneously. And the examples I have up here are, of course, Desire from Sandman, who is, uh, desires whatever you would like him or her to be. And down at the bottom is Zavin, who is from a, uh, a race of shape-changing aliens. And Zavin, when he first appeared, was, uh, was male and identified as male. And after being betrothed to a female alien of a different species, he would shape-change into a female form. And over the course of many issues, eventually began to identify as female. And uh, there was one issue where uh, he just reflexively turned into a female form without even realizing it. Uh, so, panelists, um, why do we have only a handful of examples of superpowered characters who are transgender and whose powers are specifically related to being transgender? I don't really know the answer to that. Would you guys like more or less of that? <laughs> more, more, more. <laughs> I think it would be, yeah, great fodder for writers. I mean, that's so complex. Not only. It's not just the simplistic, oh, they're transgender, they flip flop, shape shift, that's, you know, understandable enough, but all the places you could go with, um, you know, someone with such a complex identity in addition to the shape shifting possibilities, too, like, that would be a lot of fun to write about. I think we're still in the phase of trans appearance in comics that, you know, if I were to introduce somebody in a sci-fi fantasy setting, I have to admit I'm far more conscious to make sure that that person's a good guy versus um, someone who's, you know, a villain or an antagonist because, you know, more often than not, that's the, the default view in real life. And I don't want to perpetuate that in an inter entertainment story. So I think, you know, when we've got a lot more acceptance where, you know, a writer like me, who I consider myself very progressive, I feel comfortable making a trans villain because people are going to look beyond you know, the trans, they're going to look at the villain and realize that as a writer, I treat everyone equally, um, and that I'm not being biased. I'm trying to create a good story and a good character. Um, I don't think we've reached that point yet, but I see it coming soon. And I don't want to point a finger at uh, the Spider-Man editors, but it would be awesome to do a storyline <laughs> where one of the uh, Venom symbiotes uh, ends up on a character that just happens to be a cross-dresser. <laughs> a little wave going through the audience as you realize how much fun that would be. Um, and now, if people have questions, um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we don't have a microphone set up, but if you want to just line up in the center aisle. And while they're lining up, uh, panelists, any last thoughts that you'd like to go over? Fire <laughs> Okay, uh, question. Hiya. Yeah. Um, a couple slides back, there was uh, the the human non superpowered characters, and I would just like a round of introductions because I didn't recognize half the people on that slide, oh, okay. and I would really love to know who they were. There, uh, uh, further up, one more. <coughs> nope, two back. Oh, there, this. Okay. three on the top. I just I I I see them. I want to know who they are. Oh well, let's uh, go into this. The top right one, the butterfly. Uh, that's from a story, uh, spoiler alert, it's called Bang Tango by Joe Kelly. It's about to get a big reprint. Um, and spoiler alert, at the end of the first issue you learn, one of the characters is transsexual. Um, and it's a real world story, there's no superpowers. Um, uh, it's more of a film noir where the femme fatale turns out to be a uh, transsexual who's uh, completely hidden that, uh, that aspect of her life and she's in mortal danger if her mafioso uh, fiance were to find out. Uh, and at the top you see Lord Fanny uh, from The Invisibles. Um, Lord Fanny uh, is uh, a Brazilian shaman and uh, uh, her totem is the butterfly. 
and uh, her superpowers don't really have anything to do with her gender identity, but um, uh, there's a, a wonderful origin story about how Fanny uh, had her metaphysical transition, received her butterfly totem, and you'll see the butterfly symbolism a lot in transgender stories. Uh, and on the upper right, uh, that's Coagula from Doom Patrol. Uh, she's a transsexual superhero whose powers are the ability to uh, turn solid things fluid and fluid things solid, which is a metaphor for gender fluidity. Uh, and she was created and written by Rachel Pollock, who was going to be here today, um, but uh, she's not feeling well. Um, but she created the character, I gave her a long run on Doom Patrol. Thank you. And if I can just add one of my own, H's for Hero, it was a new title that I really enjoyed um, the exploration they had of, oops, in another body now, oops, body feels wrong, what's going on here? And they treated it well. Uh, in the upper right hand corner is a shot from uh, one storyline where a man is... Upper left, I think. Uh, sorry, yes, upper right, left. I believe, is Loki. I yes, mean, I might be wrong. Yes, you're oh, upper yeah. left. Uh, that's a shot from uh, Dial H for Hero. Um, where a misogynistic man was zapped into the body of a uh, beautiful female superhero. Thank you. Uh, um, feel free to stop me if you think this is too far off the core topic, but I was really reminded of this after Gail mentioned the reception from DC. Um, I got a chance to speak with James Roberts from IDW regarding that he'd introduced Transformer characters having close personal bonds, even though they would be conceived either default male or gender neutral. And it was another thing where he had that whole defense strategy ready when he brought the script to IDW. And they were like, no, it's fine. Just go ahead. <laughs> but he thought it was really important to be able to show that even characters that if they're not identifying as one gender or another, they're still going to have that where they're forming these close personal bonds. And I think that's also another important thing to keep close to the dialogue is even if you're not holding to one gender or the other, it doesn't affect your ability to be close to other people. I just wanted to bring that into the dialogue and also give props to another publisher for being very receptive to themes going forward. Yeah, it's very much just this whole um, desire in general for, for people to be labeled and pegged down. And we know who you are and what you are, but um, yeah, thank you for bringing up that point because a lot of people now are identifying with specifically you know, that fluidity and that ambiguity. So, Thank you. Do you guys feel as creators and a, a deeper pressure to create an LGBTQA character that is very interesting, more so than, you know, if someone messes up Booster Gold, ooh, but if you're introducing a trans character that you want to be really powerful and it's messed up, it could shut someone down from comics, someone that's not a cisgendered white guy from comics for a long time. Do you worry about that or do you just try and like make your character interesting? So does it gnaw at the back of your head or? I worry about it. Yeah, I, because, tokenism. Yeah, well, because especially like um, I can say, you know, I worry about that with female characters. I worry about it with any characters I create of any type of diversity because it's been we've been so long with so little diversity, and when you have a character that's created that people respond to, and then you know when you're writing licensed comics, eventually it's going to be passed to another creator, and you're just hoping that they will continue with these characters so that we don't just go backwards uh, in time. Uh, with, and so like with Alicia, um, I think that there was some talk about not having her go into the new, you know, go along with the new uh, team, and but DC insisted. So I was really actually pretty happy about that. But yeah, it's a concern. You can spend a lot of years building up a character and and creating that diversity, and then when you have to pass the baton, you know, it's, it's a worry. As an indie comic creator, um, I feel like I have a lot more freedom. You do. I don't, yeah. yeah. You do. And so, <laughs> I just try to be as honest um, as I can, and I don't uh, worry about how people receive it as much, because people are going to receive it every which way, and if they get turned off, or if they see something they weren't ready to see, that's really their journey that they have to work through and I can't really cater to them or protect them. But I try to be, um, yeah, just as honest as I can and bring the humanity into the stories as much as possible. Yeah, for me, uh, because I do own my characters and I, and I am also an indie publisher, uh, and I'm also a very subversive activist um, and a fan. 
And so I, and I said this on a panel the other day that I write as if I absolutely do not care if any of my readers are heterosexual, cisgender, Caucasian, male. But ironically, some of my most vocal fans are of that demographic. And so, and I applaud them and I'm grateful to them. And I know that no matter what I write, if they are cool enough and they're gonna stick around because they want good stories, you know, that's, that's the mind that I want in my readership. Good subver subversive people. Yes. <laughs> I get into the GOP real easily, so I, I'm there with you. Thanks, guys. Um, Thank you. Um, um, do you think in the awesome future- Awesome Wonder Woman, by I know, thing. I was gonna yeah. say shout out. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, do you think you could, as writers, make a character in the future who is um, cisgender um, and has, they state that their sexuality is private and um, they don't identify just as male, but they're a person? Well, I'm right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see stuff like that coming up. Thank you. Yes. Um. Oh yeah. Oh. Um. Crap. <laughs> I. Well, I did. I did want to point out. I really liked the pa the screen you showed with um, Desire and Zavin because I personally remember reading that arc of Runaways in middle school and going like, "This is a possibility." <laughs> like you know, you, you don't have to be one way. You can flip flop, and then that's going into agender territory and like other things. So that's also equally as important to me. Is important to me. But um, I wanted to ask. There's a lot of. Um, I see a lot of like. It seems to me like um, trans women characters. I just wanted to know in your vast comic knowledge if you had any examples of trans man characters that I could like take down because I'm learning a lot here and I just want to do more reading. Well, I'm actually part of Prism Comics, which if you've not heard of that organization, we yeah. are like a, a voice for LGBT comic uh, queer creators, friendly creators and fans. So if you go to our website, prismcomics.org, we actually um, are a good gateway to let you know about the latest works. We also do a lot of panels at various conventions. Um, we just did have the Women in Queer Comics panel. So um, definitely check out our website, and you know we are always connected and, and promoting that kind of material. Um, in terms of comics in and of themselves, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. A uh, uh, comment from the old Supergirl. What is it? A uh, comment from comment. the 90s okay. Supergirl series. And we also had uh, an image up there of a male version of Wonder Woman. Oh. Uh, that story set in the alternate universe where everyone's gender is flipped. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, and unfortunately that was a story where, you know, it's, it's the nightmarish alternate universe where, you know, right. Supergirl is like a hot teenage boy and, you know, oh, it's, you know, we have to get out of this nightmare. Oh, the agony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, any others? Um, Sir Justin <laughs> Who? Sir Justin China Knight. Oh. From Demon Knight. Oh. Yeah, and just a personal plug, my fantasy book, the one I didn't plug with the LGBT pirate crew, um, Creatures of Race, is a collection of fantasy stories with various women, and one of them is a female to female, uh, female to male character who's featured in it. So. Um, Super. Thanks, guys. Thank Howdy. Hey. Um, I'm going to try to think about how to phrase this. So. When I approach writing characters under the trans umbrella, I'm usually focusing on gender queer characters or agender characters. So right now I'm trying to figure out how to write about that experience and the body in a different way. So many of these things focus on the gendered body, which is not only a touchstone of a lot of people's experiences, but also is something that cis people focus on a lot in trying to like, not understand, but to kind of like demonize trans people. But it's still important when you gender your own body or talk about your body and gender. I was just wondering how you guys deal with that and deal with the body as both separate and connected from gender. It's so tough because there's the automatic human response to gender whatever you see. Like to any person that you see, you see their face and ultimately, like immediately you want to assign a gender one way or the other. When you start speaking with someone, you 